Hey guys, it's MJ, the student at Tree, and we're going to be looking at project appraisal, which is chapter 10 in subject CT1. And the idea behind this chapter is, let's say you're a business manager or you're a CEO or, or some high-powered guy, and you've got various projects that you can undertake. There's project A, which is to build a stadium and do all this type of stuff. Project B is to open an airline company. And project C is to, I don't know, invent some new type of robotics. And as a CEO, you have to choose which of these three projects to go into. Um, now, instead of just relying on your gut feel or what you want to do, what you can do is look at these measures that we've got over here to help you with your decision. They're going to quantify uh, the various projects and they're going to, like I said, help you make your decision on which one to pursue. Because each project is a series of cash flows. So you invest some money into building the stadium or into researching the robotics or into buying the planes and then there will be a series of incomes or positive cash flows such as ticket sales of the stadium, uh, passengers on the aeroplane and selling the robots um, to some evil genius who wants to take over the world. You know, so you will have some um, expenses and you will have some income. And this happens across a timeline. So you have your positive cash flows and your negative cash flows. Your very first measure, which is uh, one of the most important ones, is this net present value. And what it does is it simply discounts all the positive cash flows, um, adds them together and subtracts them from all the present value of all the negative cash flows, all the expenses. So you discount uh, your revenue and you subtract it from the discount of your expense and that will give you the net present value. The higher that value, the better. Um, it shows you you're going to be making more money. However, this can be um, distorted. Let's say the stadium, um, you know, it's going to cost millions to build and you're going to get millions um, in ticket revenue. So your net present value is going to be in the millions, whereas researching the robot might just require a few hundred thousand and you might get a few hundred thousand back. Uh, that net present value will be much smaller. So therefore, when we have two projects with different um, absolute cash flows, we look at the internal rate of return and what this does is it looks at um, how much return you're getting on your capital so how much each dollar or each pound is making for you and the higher that value the better it is it means your money is being used more efficiently and to calculate it you set your um, your equation of value so you have all your income on one side you have all your expense on the other side you have that discount value on both of them and you choose an interest rate such that the net present value equals zero. So, or where you have the income equals the outgo. Um, so what you can do is use the net present value formula, but instead of calculating uh, the NPV, you set the NPV to be equal to zero, and you solve for I. You may have to use interpolation in order to calculate your I because you may not be able to find it just using pure mathematics. Um, then another important one are these payback periods. You've got the discounted payback period and the normal payback period. And this is the earliest time um, it takes for the overall project to become positive with regards to its cash flow. So this is a bit of a liquidity measure. So what you want is, because normally you have your negative cash flows in the beginning and then you have your positive cash flows at the end. What you want is the net effect to be positive as soon as possible. So when you build, let's say, the, the stadium, there may be a long period before um, you can start generating profit because the stadium is being constructed. Whereas if you went into the airline uh, project, once you buy the, the aircraft, you can start selling tickets straight away and it might be very soon before you cover all your costs. Then finally, you can look at the accumulated profit which is kind of like the net present value, but on the other side of the timeline, right at the end, where you accumulate all your revenue and you subtract, subtract it from the accumulated value of all your expenses. Now, there are other uh, measures that you can take, and anyone interested in the subject, please check out uh, my video on CA1, Project Appraisal. Um, as you'll see, there's other things that can influence a project, um, emotion and 
better for strategy and business reputation and the effort required to do each of these things and experience. It, it gets quite complicated. But as far as CT1, these are the five measures you need to know. Um, I've got a little example here. If anyone just wants to pause it there and then pause it there just to see what, um, if you want to do a little example and see the numbers behind this. I do want to move on to um, the various rates of returns. Uh, rates of returns are used to calculate and rank um, asset managers and to see who made the most money, who was the best investor. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the money weighted rates of return, the time weighted rates of return, and then the linked rates of return. The money weighted rates of return is the simplest and I know this formula looks really confusing but it's not, it's very simple. What we're doing here is F stands for the fund value at time zero and we have the fund value at the end and then what we do is we're solving for I, that's the value we want to find out and the higher that value the better it is for our fund manager and T is the time or the duration. So this is our formula and let's have a quick example to just get these numbers, make it to make sense. So what we do is um, to calculate the money weighted rate of return between these two dates. We start with our fund value here, which is the very beginning. I've just gotten rid of all the excess zeros to make it simpler. So we have 100 at the beginning. It's going to be three years, so I've got my three over there, plus all my cash flows. So I'm just looking at the cash flows. Um, that's there's a 20 there and that's going to go with two years and that's just one year because that's way on the timeline. And then that's my final fund value and then what I want to do is calculate this equation of value to find my interest rate. I have to use a little bit of interpolation and I see 6.32%. Um, another one you can do is the time weighted rate of return. This one is a little bit more complicated. I mean, it's not as intuitive. You can see we're dividing stuff. It, I do get a little bit confused with this. And I have made a mistake on my formula that is supposed to be a plus, not a time. So don't, uh, must always check out on me. Don't make these silly mistakes. But what this time weighted rate of return, what it's doing is it's also looking at the fund values in between. So if we do have the exact same example, um, we can see that we, remember we're solving for i, and t is our duration. We have the very first uh, fund value of the, the beginning, which is that one there, over the cash flow right at the beginning, which is that, uh, sorry, the cash flow at the beginning will always be zero because the fund value, it will be incorporated in the fund value. So we have the starting value with our first one, we then multiply that, by the fund value, you can see T1 and T1 over there, plus the cash flow, and then over the next fund value, and we keep repeating this. And then we solve for I, and it gives us this value here. Now, this is better when it comes to comparing managers because it's not very dependent on the cash flows. So what we're gonna see, or what, what happens sometimes is, um, managers go through good times and they go through bad times. If I'm going through a bad investment time and I don't have a cash flow and then I go through a very good time and I do get this injection and that's what the cash flow is, it's additional money being added to my fund, then it's going to look like, oh wow, look at me, um, I'm so great and brilliant and that will distort the value compared to someone who got that cash injection during the bad time um, and they didn't get it there. Whereas the time weighted rate of return kind of eases that out by looking at the fund values. So, uh, like I said, in CA1 you go into this much more in much more depth, uh, but for now you just need to know the following pros and the following cons. Um, so with regards to the money weighted rate of return, uh, the big advantage is that you don't need to know the fund values um, at each end of each year, and that's very useful because it takes it is sometimes difficult to calculate those fund values. In the exam, you will be given those values, though, so don't worry about that. The disadvantages, as we've mentioned, it's very sensitive to the timing and the amount of the cash flow. You need to know all the cash flows, and the equation may not have a unique solution because, remember, we used linear interpolation. Whereas the time-weighted rate of return, it eliminates the effect of cash flow amounts and timing, which is very good when it comes to comparing um, asset managers. The solution always exists. 
However, you also need to know all the cash flows and you need to know the fund values at all the cash flow dates. Um, and yeah, that's basically, those are the two. Then there's the final one, the linked internal rate of return. Um, using the exact same set of examples, we can use this formula again. Remember, we're going to try and work out uh, what this final I is over here. And what we do is we calculate a whole bunch of eternal interest rates for the first few years. So we have 100 plus 20 equals that. And we work out each of them and then we link them all together. Um, like I said, these first glance, if you're looking at, if you haven't read anything on this chapter and you're looking at this video for the first time, you're probably going to be like, what on earth is going on? Uh, but read through your course notes, do some examples, you'll find that this is actually very easy. These are like free marks in the exam. And remember, just the pros and cons, there'll be a mark or two by mentioning those. So, I don't know, I find this chapter very easy, so I may have rushed through this video. So if there's anything that you're unclear on or want to ask me further, please let me know in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to give you a more in-depth um, answer. And yeah, that is chapter 10 and next up we'll be doing chapter 11 which is investments. Thanks guys for watching and remember to subscribe, like, share and do all those other YouTube things. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers.